One man learns the hard way to be careful liking pics on Instagram, how to stop text spam, and Sam Moscovich is back from E3 to tell us everything we need to know. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 363 for Friday, June 19th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get to today's tech news. I will give you your daily roundup of all the tech headlines after the break. But first, all week we've been talking about the Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, in Los Angeles. Here to give us a wrap-up of the show is Sam Moscovich, culture reporter at Ars Technica. Have you recovered yet? A little bit. I just landed after going to a uh, art gallery that was full of art pieces inspired by Metroid and Super Mario Brothers, and they had an open bar, so I'm doing my best. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, so yeah, I should ask you, how were the parties at E3? Oh, I I didn't get invited to as many as I had in the past. I don't know if I rubbed someone the wrong way, but mm. uh, in past years, I've been the ones that were really crazy with, um, I believe, Ice-T uh, got the group body count back together a few years ago for a Gears of War party and things like that. Uh, this year, I didn't hear any word of any Notch-powered. Uh, he's the guy who uh, created Minecraft, and right. he will throw crazy parties sometimes. I heard nothing about him or any of that, but... Uh, I think it was mostly because people were too busy recovering from virtual reality to be that excited about real reality. (laughs) That's true. That could be possible. Well, I did see, I have to say, I did see a picture on Facebook. I'm friends with Morgan Webb, who you might remember used to work with her at Tech TV. And Mm -hmm. she did post a picture that was some, that was thrown by the guy who started Minecraft. I hate to tell you, but. Well, then, uh. Everything else you can take with a grain of salt when it comes to my party. My party reporting skills are not what they used to be, I promise. I did not also, uh, Kanye West was actually walking through E3 and I didn't rub elbows with him either. That's so, too bad. Uh, so I'm sorry, celebrity and party news, I don't have it. I have game news. I apologize profusely. Well, that, that's what we really care about. And I, I did see on Facebook, this was a very elite party. So, so don't worry. Well, of course, Morgan goes to the elite party. <laughs> she does. And we don't. But let's talk about the stuff we really want to talk about. As you mentioned, VR, it was one of the most talked about topics. But unless you were really there experiencing the games, it's kind of hard for us out here to see what it's like. I mean, you can't, we can't even see what you see. So you're going to have to give us, use all the words you learned in journalism school to give us your impressions of what you saw. Oh, goodness. I will say it it is hilarious to go to some of these uh, conferences and see a virtual reality demo on a flat two-dimensional screen, just why bother? But uh, I was fortunate enough to try out, I'd say all the heavy hitters that are uh, all fighting to get you to care about virtual reality. And I'd say a couple of years ago, I would have frowned at it and said, no way. But I think some of these companies are really getting the hint as to what does and doesn't work and how to get people excited. Um, First up, Oculus was on hand. They had had a press conference last week to debut uh, a couple of things, including the final retail model that's going to come out at the beginning of 2016. They say Q1. Um, and they also had, which the thing we were really excited to try out was the new touch controller. Uh, you hold it in your hands. Um, and it looks, uh, it's, I think it's scrolled down. A, oh, there you go. Yeah, they're not that one. <laughs> I'm going visually. They're like little uh, handlebars. Sort they're of little just... hand, yeah, they're little handles uh, that have a joystick. There they are. They have a joystick, two buttons, and they have these grips, and they have these little rings over that your, your hands slip into. And the reason they do that is because they're sensing whether your fist is open or closed, whether your finger is open or closed. Uh, we got to go into a room where we put these uh, the headset and then the controllers on, and stand on one pad. We couldn't walk around. We had to stand still. Uh, And then when we were in this room, we put the headset on, we held these controllers, and another person appeared in front of us. He was doing the same test as we were, uh, and we could see this person as if they were right in front of us, handing us things. We was able to give us a fist bump when he held his hand out with holding the controller, and I had mine. Um, We could point at each other. We could do a thumbs up and and a... like this, we could go up and down, and it could sense these basic uh, hand gestures so that we could do more articulated things than you can with an Xbox controller. We could throw things, we could pick stuff up, and everything felt really natural in terms of being in a virtual world. Uh, Everything we touched, picked up, and moved around 
moved just in kind. When we moved our heads around, it was solid. It wasn't shaky. The new headset is really comfortable because of the, the change strap. It feels lighter than it ever did. Uh, I don't know measurement exactly how different it is, but it feels, it feels good. Um, but the problem is that touch controller isn't going to be the default. They want to get this thing, the headset, out to market faster. So they're going to attach it to the uh, Xbox control, the Xbox One controller, I should say, uh, so that it'll be used as sort of a sit down, use a mix of controller and moving your head around to do stuff. Um, and while the touch is going to require uh, possibly a second camera, Oculus currently it has a webcam looking right at you as you use it to track where you are in the room. Uh, and it seems like their big challenge right now is making sure they can track these extra controllers in addition to your head moving around. Um, but assuming they do get that technical stuff, uh, that hurdle over with, Oculus plus these touch controllers to me is a really compelling thing because there's no sickness. It feels really smooth. So the touch uh, controllers, are they are they meant to really for games? Like, you know, you mentioned a lot of things, but like, you know, what I read a lot about it was like picking up guns, you know, for mm -hmm. first person shooters. Is that what they're really meant for? Do you think that they're also trying to maybe design them for some sort of like medical use or, you know, really some kind of virtual? Oh, absolutely. I feel like uh, these kinds of controllers, and I'm going to talk about another system that has a similar thing. Um, I have, by the way, I have a house fly that just showed up. This is what happens on live television, at, at, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> It happened to they, me last week. It's okay. Oh, good. It's, it's we great. can edit that uh, out. But you can, but you can move <laughs> your hands into a scene. You, uh, you can't walk around, but imagine a virtual cadaver or even a real life one that you're actually controlling by, with a robot in the distance. I absolutely had enough fidelity with the hands to do things like point and focus and see other people in the virtual space doing the same thing in real time. Uh, I think that would require more than an internet connection in terms of that having that latency feel like we're both in the same space. But absolutely, uh, there's obviously, I think, the, the fact that the controller recognizes thumb, pointer finger, and the rest of the hand feels like a very gun sort of thing. Like, it can sense whether you're holding the gun or not and whether you're shooting the trigger or not. But uh, I do believe that some of these uh, ones that sense total movement and not just a head uh, could absolutely be used in science fields and medical fields. I'm really excited about those possibilities. Um, and whenever you let me go, I will talk about the one that's even better than Oculus. That is it, absolutely is it Steam VR? Is that Steam you, VR? Okay, let's go, I, let's move on. You to Steam. look at look at me light up. I can see myself in the screen. I love Steam VR. Um, I've never used a virtual reality system like it before. And Oculus uh, is actually finally with its touch controllers coming close. But being able to walk around with a headset and full Wii remote like controllers lets you feel a sense of scale and a sense of presence that just doesn't exist in any other game experience I've ever had. Um, I started this demo, I put on a very Oculus-like headset. It wasn't as smooth as the current final Oculus model, I will say, that one is incredibly comfortable, but it's pretty close. Um, yeah, that's the one that's on the screen right now. That's a, a slightly older version. The newer one is a little bit smaller. And those controllers I held so that my thumbs were on those little circles that you can see. Um, but I sit down, I hold the controllers, I put on some headphones, and then I'm told to stand up. He said, it's not a sitting demo, stand up. And I have about a block that's about three meters by four meters that I can walk around. Um, if I'm about to run into a real wall or into the edge of the normal play field, uh, a little virtual wall appears. It's very comfortable. I, I can, I, and I'm able to walk around rooms. I could, I could walk through a battlefield and peer at all the little soldiers walking around beneath me, which I think would be amazing for a game like Dota 2, which uh, Valve currently makes, or any other strategy game, where instead of having to click a resilient times around anywhere, you could just grab something in real life and move it around the room. Um, and, and, and in a medical or even architectural uh, sort of, not even game, but application, you'd be able to, I believe, walk around and manipulate things in real space. Um, incredibly smooth. The feeling of picking things up in virtual space is... Unreal. Uh, one of the designers of a game called Job Simulator, which funnily enough is simulating what life will be like once humans no longer do anything for themselves. And it's like a reminder of, of what life used to be like before virtual reality took over. Uh, the guy created it because he had so much fun picking things up and putting them down in a full room. He, he realized he was able to make Jenga without having to really code all that much. So much physics information and so much spatial information was already ready to rock. So he goes, oh, this is so fun to just pick things up and put them down. Let's make a game about that. 
it's sort of the wee bowling of the virtual reality generation. I was able to just go through a kitchen and do all kinds of basic kitchen tasks. And I was amazed at how fun that was. And the other demo that's showing on the screen right now, this is a video of the Gallery Six Elements, which is a adventure game in which you walk around in small spaces um, and can really play with everything in the space, grabbing it with your hands, manipulating it. There's a little bit of haptic feedback when you use these controllers, which means you can, it, it isn't just touching stuff that you don't actually feel. If you grab or touch something, you feel it right back. Um, it's, uh, it's really, really cool to be able to walk around in virtual space as opposed to a joystick effect. Um, and I say that because at E3, there were a few virtual reality demos that were terrible because you sit down, you hold a controller, and you press with a joystick to move while your head is staying still. You end up getting this mix of vertigo and disassociation, a lot of inner ear trouble, and I almost ralphed, to be quite honest. Uh, when a game doesn't know what it's doing with leading you around a virtual space while you're wearing a really all-encompassing headset, it feels too real, uh, and yet not real enough, and it's gross. Um, but the newer Oculus, at least with the touch controller and St Steam VR, have absolutely solved that. That's great. So you just you went to see the Steam Studios in Seattle last week and did some interviews, and they didn't let you take any pictures, sadly, except for, of the coffee makers. Um, for some reason that I wasn't quite sure. You have so, a lot of pictures so of their coffee makers. Eric and Chet at uh, Steam and at Valve uh, have a really, really dark sense of humor and like to basically mess with me every time I talk to them. Uh, not just myself. I don't know if they pick on me in particular because I'm in the Seattle area or what. But yes, there was quite the coffee machine tour. Um, but I couldn't take photos of anything and they didn't show up at E3. And I think that's because they know that there are certain things that are cumbersome. You have to set these blocks up, uh, mount them on opposite corners of the play space you want to use. You have to clear your floor and it's still got some wires. They're not completely done with the wires in the Steam VR set. And they're trying to reduce the wires and trying to make everything cleaner and nicer looking. And I think they're honestly better off uh, getting all of that ready for the people who are going to poo-poo the little things that are wrong, as opposed to myself, who gets so excited about, one, the possibility, and two, the amazing feeling it already has. Um, I'm actually, I personally, if I was in charge over there, I would have said, F it. Come on, let's do it. It's that good. It is that good. Um, and then there was, uh, I've got other ones. I can keep going on virtual reality. Well, I want to stay with Steam for a second because in your article, someone that you interviewed called it, uh, they called it IMAX, they called it room-sized VR and said it was like having an IMAX in your living room, not an IMAX like the computer, but I-M-A-X, like the big giant theater. Uh, you published this article and then someone from IMAX emailed Ars Technica and uh, tell us about the letter that they wrote to Ars Technica. Basically, it was a sort of veiled legal threat that, said that we were infringing on IMAX's trademark by describing anything as IMAX. They made a, it was, I was actually out of town when this all happened, but this uh, basically, they, they wanted us to remove any reference of IMAX that they felt like was uh, incorrect. And our legal writer, Joe Mullen, one, wrote a wonderful response. I, I encourage you guys to go to Ars Technica and check it out if you haven't already, to remind him of why uh, companies can't control uh, trademark terms the way that they think they can. Uh, to their credit, once uh, we responded to uh, the IMAX Corporation and published our response, they were very quick to send an apology, uh, which they called an IMAX size apology. <laughs> and uh, we absolutely appreciated that. It's nice to see a company uh, take a response like that and have a nice mea culpa and move forward. So I will possibly uh, return to their branded large scale uh, screen format in the near future. Well, it's one of those interesting little Twitter storms that blows up. You know, it's just like, how can they say? I mean, you didn't even, you said it was IMAX-like. I was, it wasn't even myself saying it. Right. I was quoting somebody else trying to come up with what he thought was a valid comparison. And, you know, it, one thing I learned in journalism school, uh, which was not very much, which is <laughs> <laughs> that that is absolutely okay to do. If I quote someone and they are, say something really terrible, uh, you know, there's a whole no. Anyway, point being, uh, it's all over. Ars Technica and IMAX are best of friends. It's going real great. <laughs> but it does bring up an interesting point that it obviously they felt they might have felt a little bit threatened by VR. And, uh, you know, it. Do you, do you not agree? Oh, I think there are a lot of companies that don't know what's going to happen. Uh, some people are drinking the Kool-Aid and think it's going to take over and we're all going to wear headsets and be hiding uh, like terrify, like a terrifying lawnmower man future. Other people think virtual reality isn't going to take it all, that it's too weird, that people aren't ready for it. But 
once you use it and have an aha moment with it, you, it, it's really hard to go back. It is such a compelling computer experience. It, it liberates the mouse. You now have a sense of 3D computer space. I really believe the line is now being drawn and one side of it's gonna be people who say it's amazing and can't imagine computing without it. And the other side saying, I am too old for this crap. It really, it's coming. It's coming and uh, I would be, I'd be terrified of if I was running any sort of uh, large screen company or any company that depends on the old guard of showing things. It's a, it's a wild, it's a wild west. And I've played with enough of it that's any good to say it's coming and it's legit. All right. Well, we have two more in your four, your top four. Project Morpheus you, mm -hmm. was the third. Uh, tell that's, us what you saw there. Sony, what they're doing is they're taking things that are already that already exist. Your PlayStation 4, uh, the Move Wand, which didn't necessarily do so well when it came out for the PlayStation 3, um, and the little camera that they already started selling. with. Uh, it's a Kinect-like camera that never really got used for many games. Uh, so they're adding to that, essentially, um, a pretty lightweight, simple uh, headset, which is seen here with the little lights that pop up so it can be tracked, and uh, your own pair of headphones. Uh, so what their shot, I believe, is that they've already got kind of penetration. It, it doesn't take as much to get your PlayStation set up. Oculus and Steam VR are both going to require pretty powerful computers, and Sony is pushing, essentially, no, uh, it's a PlayStation 4. It's going to cost, you know, 350 bucks. Uh, plus the other stuff. If you've already bought the, the game system, you know, it's less of a, a hurdle already. And they have games. They have things that feel like games. Uh, and they're going to launch early next year with things that... The, a company that makes games that's proven, as opposed to Oculus, which is right now scrambling to find proven game people to come on board. Uh, and Steam VR, which is really early. They're depending on sort of the indie crowd and they're depending on small fry developers to make stuff. Sony has a giant company that can pump out stuff. And we saw a huge range of demos. Uh, there was one in particular in which we were in a, a getaway car. It was the the heist getaway, I believe was the name of it. Uh, and we had, were sitting in the passenger seat using these little move wands, looking around in the car and shooting them at other cars driving around. It was a high speed uh, gun shootout. And it was really simple and compelling. I didn't feel sick at all. I felt It felt fun. It felt so easy and natural to just look around and aim and shoot at these uh, moving targets. I was I was able to take down a motorcycle and a giant uh, windowless van very quickly. I'm sure my mother's very proud of that <laughs> skill. Um, so that, I believe, it, it wasn't necessarily impressive in a major moving around or blowing my mind virtual reality way, but it had games, it worked, and I think that they understand the limits. There was nothing that made me sick. There, the games were sort of in this constrained way where they knew, okay, you're not going to run around Call of Duty style just yet. You might have to sit in a cockpit but we're going to figure it out and we're going to move forward. So there's hope for that. Um, so the fourth, Microsoft the HoloLens. We've talked a little bit about it. We saw a little bit. Did you actually get to wear them and play? I got to I got to put on a HoloLens, which I hadn't gotten to do yet. My other uh, Ars Technica compatriots had. Um, and I was both impressed and a little let down. We're going to have a longer article about this coming out pretty soon uh, because uh, the games editor Kyle Orland also got to try one out. Um, if you look here at this video, this is footage of Microsoft's press conference. And... At the basic level, what you see here really is what it feels like. When you walk up wearing these glasses, this virtual stuff appears on a table. It appears perfectly in sync with the table as you walk around corner to corner. Uh, in my case, I saw a, um, a Halo demonstration where they showed a level that I was about to play through. It was almost like a, a debriefing by a sergeant before I went into battle. Um, and I could walk around and see all the buildings and I could see there were uh, these transparent structures and I could look through that looked really cool. And it all stayed very static on the table and there were markings on the walls that also stayed very static. Uh, the big catch is that the field of view on this current HoloLens, as opposed to the very first one that Ars Technica demoed months ago, uh, has been shrunk. Um, so imagine, I, I've been telling people, take your fingers about like this and get them about a foot away from your face. That is how much virtual content you're going to see. Anything outside of that, it doesn't appear. So if there's, if I'm too close and there's supposed to be a virtual, I don't know, a virtual little guy right here. This is my one of my drink uh, coasters. Um, if I'm too close to it, then some of it just doesn't even appear. It gets sort of blocked out. Um, and so because that's a limit, it takes you away from that really amazing effect. It's really cool and you want to get up close to stuff. And as soon as you get too close to it, uh, it gets cropped. So I think unless Microsoft has plans to get that smoother and better, uh, that's going to be a real problem. And people may even want to wait for the second generation of HoloLens 
Because while the effect is amazing, it, it's hard to imagine it really working in a game way if I have to constantly be moving around and making sure everything's in my field of view. So the one that they displayed in the event in January, the Windows 10 event, that, that was bigger? There was a bigger field of view? There was a bigger field of view, according to our uh, Microsoft lead writer, Peter Bright. Um, he, he talked, he, in fact, he's tried out multiple models, and he said that it shrunk in one that he had tried in uh, May, just last month. And that has persisted. This, by the way, the demo you guys are showing right now is exactly what I saw. That was the room I was in uh, with things appearing on that table. And even like that little thing that just said, take comm chip, it would just pop right up. It would be there. There was one time where there was a wall 20 feet away and there was text that appeared on it. Perfectly crisp. Whether I was really close or really far away, it looked crisp, but it also looked real in terms of even if it was, if it was far away, it looked far away. If it was close, it looked close. So yeah, the effect is amazing. The, the fit of the headset was actually very comfortable. Uh, it had nice headphones so I could tell where stuff was coming from. But if that field of view is itty bitty, that's, that's gonna be the deal breaker, Microsoft. Well, so in January, they made a big deal about how this isn't virtual reality, it's augmented reality. That is very different. But the way you're talking about it, you're kind of interchanging these four you know, systems. So do you, do you still think there's a real difference between virtual I reality and augmented reality? I think people are gonna target both. I feel like these are gonna be interchangeable, especially this room scale stuff where you can imagine walking around a virtual table and HoloLens content, I believe, is going to be similar where you're going to have, like in that Microsoft, or I'm sorry, that Minecraft demo we saw, it was you could see a Minecraft world and you could issue voice commands or use a controller to manipulate stuff on that table. So either way, we're projecting things that aren't really there into virtual space and game makers are going to do similar things with both. So I think it's really important to figure out what is comfortable what feels realistic and what's fun. Uh, and they're all going to be judged, it really, in, they're, they're not going to be separated in that sense, especially as people battle and they compete. And no one's going to buy more than one virtual reality kit, in my opinion. That's a, it, it's going to be hard enough to get anyone to buy one, certainly not two, so. Right. So we heard a lot of Microsoft announcements this week. Or they were pretty early. We talked about the backwards compatibility for Xbox games on Xbox One and the ability to stream Xbox One and Xbox 360 games on Windows 10. Uh, we also already talked a little bit uh, earlier in the week about the Elite Wireless Controller, but you got to hold it in your hand. What did you think about this $150 I did, I did. controller? I got to actually get a world's first look at it. They messed up. <laughs> and I, I, I ran into a corner, grabbed it, and started snapping photos before anyone could yell at me. Uh, so those photos I took totally gorilla style. Uh -huh. um, it is $150 is a lot to ask for a video game controller, especially for it, people who may have already gotten an Xbox One and a couple of controllers. But they are really trying to earn that amount. And I will say the feel of it definitely feels like it's at least worth 100 bucks. Um, they've changed the rubber topping to feel a little like... I don't know, it's designed for people with sweaty palms, I suppose. It felt really nice in my hands. Um, the joysticks you can now remove and switch out. So there's now three different kinds that have concave or convex or different textures, uh, as you can see there. Uh, and the panels on the back are super interesting um, that you can now touch stuff with your middle and ring fingers. Uh, you can assign those to whatever buttons you want. And in a game like Halo, when you the difference between a kill or be killed in a multiplayer match is getting your finger off of the joystick and getting it onto a button. Um, that's th that, This has just been the land of modded controllers. Nobody from any game company, from any big one, has released something like this. This is a real big move on Microsoft's part to say we support this sort of incredibly high-level play for people who believe that milliseconds matter in these sorts of online games, which, you know, with Halo 5 coming around the corner, uh, that's, that's going to be a really big push on their part to say, hey, we want first-person fans to be on our system, and here's the controller for that. Uh, but yeah, it felt very comfortable, very heavy. Uh, I, I didn't like the new D-pad. They still have the older one, and you'll definitely want to stick with that. The new one is really more of just, I believe, a flare thing than it is an actual control thing. But yeah, very solid. It's got a lot of steel. looks cool. I'm into it. I'll probably end up getting one. So what is your overall pick of the, the show? Ooh. E3 is a tough one to narrow down that way. Uh, there is a lot of cool stuff. Uh, Nintendo had a disappointing uh, conference, both in terms of its press conference and then uh, all the content they brought out at the expo floor. But they did have one of the better games, which was Super Mario Maker. Um, I actually went to the Nintendo World Championships uh, at the uh, Staples Center down the block 
uh, the day before E3 started, in which they it was almost like The Wizard from 1989, where people were playing and playing a mix of old games and new games. And this was the big reveal that they had created four super hard levels uh, that were I'd never seen Mario levels like this outside of hacks on YouTube, where people will like hack the ROM and make the game crazy. Um, and you can do really, really incredible stuff. Just and it's going to come shipped with all kinds of crazy content already. But even in that one, you can see oversized characters. Uh, enemies can become helmets that you wear that give you different powers that the games haven't had before. Um, there's just a lot of weird stuff uh, that you're going to be able to do, which I think is going to the community is going to have a lot of fun with that. And that hasn't happened with a Mario game in a long time, I think. So that's really good. So that would be my honorary mention for something that I think was both old and new. Um, but in terms of a game that has a lot of glitz and gets me really excited, I think my number one, the show, and I was surprised to say this, would be uh, Halo 5 Guardians. Uh, they gave me one of these pins, so convenient for me. I can give you a little visual there. Um, they didn't show very much single player beyond the campaign footage that was in the conference, but I did get to play two rounds of the new Warzone mode, which is a 12 on 12 giant battlefield sort of game, not to be confused with Battlefield, but it has a mix of uh, objectives, as a mix of cool maneuvers. It has a mix of the old and new in Halo to make it bigger and more interesting to me. Um, I, I guess what I really liked about it was that it was it, it felt like it took all the really cool things from Titanfall and Call of Duty and other shooters in Battlefield, quite frankly, and rolled them all together in a very familiar feeling Halo package so that you have generally these really comfortable, fast mechanics, a really good range of balanced weapons, a lot of vehicles to get into, and this sort of experience point accumulation. Um, you can kill other opponents to get points. You can take out um, non-character bosses that are on the battlefield, which is a little uh, League of Legends or Dota 2-ish, uh, and, and find your own path to being really good in terms of being a defender, being an attacker, different ways of attacking. Um, it, it's hard in the first-person world to really get people excited to say, hey, here's another way to shoot guys with guns. But this is one of those where me, as a real big uh, cynic and been there, done that kind of guy, to look and go, this is a really cool way to shoot other people with guns. So uh, the fact that it impressed me that much and that I absolutely can't wait to sit in a 12 on 12 session of Halo Warzone, to me, I, that's, that's my game of the show. But it's really, hard to, it's really hard to just narrow down to one. It was a pretty crowded show. So that, that's released in October of this year. That's when we'll Yeah, see end it. of October of this year, that'll be out. And hopefully it'll work because the last Halo game uh, was the Master Chief Collection, which collapsed when it uh, went online at the end of December last year. It collapsed really, really in a big way. And hopefully uh, Microsoft has learned something from that server meltdown and will have everything ready to rock uh, in October of this year. If they know what's good for them. If they know it's good for them, yes. So uh, there was a lot of nostalgia. You talked a little bit about some of those games. Uh, did you see more than you've seen at other conferences? Well, there was there was absolutely a push. I think Sony's press conference was huge in this regard. Uh, they had uh, a comeback of Shenmue, which uh, had been rumored, but I just thought that was some drunken guy talking on Twitter. I didn't realize he knew something. Uh, that was Sega's classic franchise uh, from the Dreamcast era, which is coming to uh, apparently computer and PlayStation 4 thanks to its incredibly huge Kickstarter. Yeah, it was um, like it was they raised $2 million in 12 hours or something? It was, I believe, the second fastest Kickstarter just uh, behind Pebble Time. Um, absolutely. It, even though they all they showed was a very tiny little video and they said some of the people from the old Shenmue were coming back. So that's a lot of faith. But that's, you know, faith has buoyed more than a few Kickstarters in our day. Uh, after that, there was, or before, right before that, Final Fantasy VII's HD remake, which people had been clamoring for, was announced. Uh, and then there was also, at the very early on in Sony's conference, they announced The Last Guardian, which was a uh, game that we never thought would actually come out. There had been a lot of reports of woes in its development a few years ago. Uh, so that looks like it's going to actually not only come out, but look like it's going to come relatively soon. Um, Microsoft had a Rare Rewind collection, which was uh, a bunch of Rare's old classics from uh, the Spectrum computer in the UK all the way to Xbox and Xbox 360 and many Nintendo platforms in between. Uh, this will actually be the first major release of two N64 gems 
uh, that I'm actually excited about, which is Blast Core and Jet Force Gemini. And that sentence makes me sound like a 13-year-old, and I do not care. Uh, those were really cool games that Nintendo just sort of shrugged their shoulders and let get dust. Uh, and it's cool to see Rare and Microsoft work together to get to those. And the Battletoads arcade machine, which most people didn't even know existed until this week when they announced this, that's going to be in there and a bunch of behind-the-scenes content. Uh, I, I mean, there's... It, this felt like it was less of, oh, we're going to rehash this, the series that you saw two or three years ago, and more of, let's go back to the things that are 10 or 20 years old. Let's let's really go back to the games that really got people excited long ago and refresh those, um, which I think is a lot better than another Uncharted or another Assassin's Creed. Not that I'm against more of those games, but it's it's if we're going to go nostalgic, if we're going to retread, let's really retread. Let's really see what we can do. Uh, also, I just got giddy because I saw Blast Core on the TV, which is, uh, oh, it's just such a dumb, lovable game. Um, but yeah, so it, if we're, if we're going to be rehashing stuff, let's really rehash. Let's not remaster something from two years ago, which is what last year's E3 was all about. Let's go way back. So I'm into it. Well, it is interesting because I think for so many of us, gaming just gets imprinted on us at a certain age. It's like smells and, you, you know, you, it doesn't matter. Like Halo can be amazing, but if it was something that you played when you were nine or 12 or whatever age that was, like that can be the most important game to you, no matter what Oh, absolutely. Like. Yes, absolutely. So what uh, about, I'm, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I was going to make a really bad joke about, uh, what was it? It was a uh, snake rattle and roll, but I'm, I'm going to let that one go. <laughs> okay. What about mobile gaming? Was there anything new there? Man, mobile gaming did not exist for the most part. Uh, EA announced a uh, Minions branded game for smartphones coming soon, which I'm sure uh, will make them a ton of money when terrible parents hand their iPhones or tablets to their kids and the kids just rack up in app purchases. Um, I'm sure that's the goal, and I'm sure they're very happy about knowing exactly what that is. Uh, Fallout actually had their own smartphone app launch Uh that was uh, the Fallout Shelter, which I haven't even installed yet, uh, and I should probably do that so that I can get ready for the Fallout 4 apocalypse coming, uh, I believe, at the end of this year. Yes, yeah, so um, I played a little bit of Fallout Shelter on uh, my iPad. Um, it, it's very, it's cartoony, but it is good. I mean, it does put you, it's a little anxiety-making. Mm -hmm. You know, you have mm -hmm. to keep these little guys alive or else. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I'm I'm glad you are keeping them keeping them going. You'll have to update me next time we talk and how your people are right. doing. I'm keeping them uh, going while my kids are playing the minion game. And, and. Probably. <laughs> I'm so sorry for your in-app purchase pool. Um, and there was not a ton for the 3DS. There was a little bit. There was a new Zelda game uh, in which three it's a three-player game, and you combine forces to do three-player puzzles, like stacking on top of each other and having to all be in separate... Like, one person will uh, lead the bad guy away, and the other two will work together to get its weak points, because what's a Zelda game without weak points? Um, and they had... Um, a new Paper Mario mashup where it's Paper Mario and Mario and Luigi, which are the two uh, Mario uh, Quest series of the past decade or so, and they're mashing up. And that was fun and cute. Uh, and then they had a Metroid Prime rehash, which looked like that 2006 game for the DS brought back looking almost exactly the same, which was kind of a bummer. And that was about it for the 3DS. The PlayStation Vita wasn't even on the show floor. Not a single... I looked. I spent two days combing the entire conference because I said, I'm going to find one. I couldn't find one. So it's almost like Sony saying, eh, we're just going to, we're just going to do PS4, uh, which I found surprising because there are a lot of indie developers who are still releasing things on the Vita. It's a very indie friendly platform. So I thought it was weird that they didn't even have, you know, like two or three out for fun. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it, it didn't feel like companies were really pushing the mobile or smartphone angle that they had. I feel like they all collectively said, you know what? We're good. We're, let's let's focus on consoles and bigger experiences. That's what E3 is about. Um, and honestly, E3 was just as much about, instead of mobile games, it was really PC games that happened to be also coming on consoles. There were so many games I would go up and I would be about to play and go, oh, wait, it's already on early access. Oh, wait, this is already launched on Steam. There was a lot of that. And it looks like uh, the game companies really are trying to fill out the ranks of good games with stuff that is already being supported on PC. Uh, now is as good a time as any to have a decent computer if you want to play every game as opposed to waiting for which console happens to get console exclusivity for it. So uh, I'm excited about that because I have a computer plugged into my television. It's a great way to play four-player, couch-friendly indie games. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good time right now. It is what I, it, I felt like this year the best 
company this year was developers. It's easier now than ever to publish games wherever you want to publish them on powerful systems that people can afford. Uh, I think it's awesome. And it's going to be a really good next year, at least, for good games. Well, Sam, thank you so much. Sam Muscovich is the culture reporter at Ars Technica. He's at Sam Red on Twitter. You can read more at Ars Technica. Um, I always love your uh, take on all the games. Uh, I rarely talk to anyone who's as excited about them as you are. So thank you so much. I, I'm always happy to come on. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a good All right, one. take care. Coming up, Twitter wants to be Pinterest and why you might need to be careful when you like Instagram photos. But first, today's sponsor of Tech News Tonight is Blue Apron. Now, we don't ask you for money here, but we do ask that you support our sponsors if they're offering something that you might like. And hey, we all have got to eat. Blue Apron makes it easy to cook delicious meals by delivering fresh, ready-to-cook meals right to your door. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh ingredients perfectly proportioned with step-by-step -step recipe instructions, including beautifully printed pictures. It makes cooking healthy meals easy and fun. No trips to the grocery store and no waste from unused ingredients. I love Blue Apron for me. It also makes a great thank you gift to friends or family. A great way to help out a friend or family member who loves to cook but I might not have the time or the resources to go to the grocery store. Each balanced meal is 500 to 700 calories per serving. Cooking takes half an hour. Shipping is free. They work around your schedule and your dietary preferences and Blue Apron's experts source only the best seasonal ingredients for incredible meals like like huevos rancheros with salsa verde, radishes and avocado, and seared cod with spring vegetables and lemon mustard vinaigrette. Blue Apron, it's the better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following. Today on their blog, Google announced that effective immediately, the company will honor requests to move, remove revenge porn from Google search results. Revenge porn is the term for nude or sexually explicit images shared without consent, usually from an ex-partner. So it's the images that might have been taken with all parties complicit, but not shared that way. So the headlines you'll see might be Google removes revenge porn. Those the Headline's a bit, a bit misleading. The company has not hired people to comb the web for this kind of garbage. They're simply agreeing to remove the content if someone lets them know that it's there. The FCC voted yesterday to allow phone carriers to block robocalls and spam text messages to cell phones and landlines. And like the Google story we just talked about, they're not going to do it automatically, but upon your request. Now, why do we need this rule, you might ask? If you've ever asked your carrier to stop telemarketers or spam texts, they might have said that they couldn't because they were required by the FCC not to block any commu communication. Now they are no longer required. Twitter has been busy this week trying to pretend to be a company that makes money. Yesterday, we talked about their new content curation program, Project Lightning. Today, they want to help you buy things that you see on Twitter. Kurt Wagner over at Recode reports that Twitter collections will essentially be product pages that might include pricing information, tweets about a product, user reviews, pricing, and even a buy button. So it's sort of like Pinterest for guys. If you're a parent with a kid on Instagram, one of the easiest ways to catch them not following the phone rules is to see what time they're liking and posting photos. Remember, this is not stalking. That's parenting. CNET reports that this week, one intrepid blogger was trying to stalk or parent much-loved Pablo Sandoval of the Boston Red Sox, formerly of the Giants. The blogger noticed that Sandoval had liked someone's Instagram photo right smack in the middle of their game against the Atlanta Braves. Sandoval has apologized and was benched. He also had to admit that he liked the photo while he was in the bathroom, which personally, I think that is punishment enough having to admit that. But that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Just go to twit.tv and click on the live button. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.